Speakers up, join me up here on stage. We're gonna have a little discussion with all of you. Have you, have you soaked in all this information? <laughs> Everyone take a deep breath together. It's gonna be okay, it's Friday morning. We're gonna talk about material and immaterial resources. So we have a couple of mics in the back. Martin and Lisa are here at your disposal to run to you when you'd like to ask a question to our speakers today. I will spend the next couple of minutes uh, just sort of gently getting going, and then we'll open it up to you guys. Um, a few rules about the, the, the rules about the Q&A. Please make sure that you tell us who you are, where you're from. It'd be great if you could stand. That way we can all see you and hear you. Um, and if you wouldn't mind phrasing your question as a question. Thank you. Uh, all right, so I'll start us off just briefly to get the, get the Q&A juices flowing. Are you ready? Um, it's occurred to me as I'm listening to the three of you and sort of thinking about the wise concept towards cities that we've, we've decided to, to frame smart cities as. Um, there are our layers of material resources, which we've just gone through, and then our layers of immaterial resources, which Finn, you touched on as well. This sort of human relationships that are necessary, our relationships to time, to nourishment, to each other, to our technology. So I'm wondering, how do we understand the true impacts of ourselves in our cities, humans in our cities, in order to move towards this non-extractive architecture, non-extractive being? How do we understand our true impact if we can't see what those impacts are? If we can't see the immaterial resources that we're trying to sustain and nourish? Um, this comes from a place of immaterial being the data flows. If we can't see them, how do we trust them? How do we deal with them? How do we understand their true impact? If we can't understand, because we can't see the tiny, tiny, teen, teeny, tiny creatures, how do we understand our true impact? And then, Finn, as you point out, the immaterial resources that are needed in Rosengord and Nimham, they're necessary to sustain our cities. How do we understand our true impact if we can't see them? I'll just leave it there. So, sure, I can start with that. I think with great patience is the start of the answer. Mm. Uh, but I, I also, I mean, one of the reasons why I picked the examples that I picked was A, because we sort of undersell the importance of the younger generation as a target group for adopting new technology and changes that we perhaps don't necessarily as adults, and I we don't want to say that within quotation marks, uh, think that they are willing to engage with and, and understand usually much quicker than, than us adults. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the spirit of sort of exploring the digital uh, technologies is something, I mean, I kind of grew up in a very rural sort of environment myself, and I had a lot of fun with stuff that was just around me. But today, stuff that's around you is also digital and also sensor-based. And I think understanding that you can't just build sort of purposeful functions that are going to serve us, but rather help us explore the world that we live in and sensors that are more for exploration rather than for very, very specific purposes because otherwise we're wasting our money. I mean, are we wasting our money really when we are promoting solutions and promoting data sharing that allows people to better understand the environment they're in? I want to say no because this pays off in the careers that they develop and the future that they build that goes beyond sort of the here and now into more of the future of our society. So I, I want to start off with that. Patience is a great place to start. Yeah, I uh, talk, a, uh, try and answer the question from what I understand, which is perhaps a bit more analog. Um, and um, I, th I mean, I think there are ways we can use when we're talking about architecture and planning in the built environment, we can use regulation 
mm. uh, standards, building standards um, that uh, that do measure um, whole life carbon um, impacts, but also taxation. I think is really encouraging and interesting steps that the EU is taking to um, to genuine to to start to tax things based on their true societal costs mm. rather than um, and rather than necessarily we're just you know us just taxing labor mm. um and that can play an important part and that will increasingly play an important part that will force economic decisions that are, that are a bit more aligned to their true environmental or holistic global impacts but i think also there's we shouldn't underestimate the role that that design can also play in this mm. and uh the kind of culture you build up around what kind of buildings we make, what kind of stories they tell. I think one of the things that's beautiful about that um, Atelier Luma project is, you know, every time you touch that door handle, you realize you're connecting with something from the landscape that has a kind of quality and a pleasure to it. Mm. Um, and that's part of the very overt part of the storytelling. And I do think that in the same way, the international movement in the 1930s, uh, 40s, 50s, where architects really tried to create a kind of uh, outward looking, um, uh, seamless, um, pure, clean architecture that 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 raised uh, away some of those um, no local no differences <laughs> that tried to reduce friction. Yeah. Um, became a kind of it became a fashion. It became a style that mm. I think that an equivalent thing is already happening and will increasingly happen around a kind of awareness of our wider impacts uh, on the world, and that that will be something that we um, that we culturally value, not mm. just technically. Uh, uh, Optimize, yeah. Mm. Mm. Cool. Inna, thoughts? Mm, I thought it was really cool the story that you told with the kids and how fast they were actually in grasping those quite complex uh, concepts. And that said, I think we should be also really careful about doing this thing of like, the youth is going to save us, Greta, you know? Uh, we as adults have a certain status, certain power, and we should be able also to use it and carry the responsibility to actually make things better for the next generation and not put the responsibility on them. But that said, um, I think we kind of underestimate the human imagination and creativity if we talk about those things. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're intangible, so we can't see them. Mm. Uh, it's all about what attention are you bringing to. Um, and it's always a political thing, what you want to be seen and experienced and what not. And I think if we talk about untangible things, the most important stuff is actually uh, the layers that I showed you, understanding how my personal experience is defined by, by those layers above me. The city defines the space in which I move. It defines if the space is dominated by cars or by bicycles. The government, again, decides other things. And what we kind of learned in the last decades we kind of learn to become consumers, right? We make our choices by, oh, I stopped eating meat. This is my choice, right? But we, instead, we need to learn, and we also need to really empower the generations that are coming to learn how this individual perspective can change the intangible systems on the layers above. And that's the most important skill we need to, in like, yeah, for collaborative survival, basically. Mm. Agency, you think agency is a way to being a political actor, being honest, like you can actually change things as an individual mm. if you collaborate with others mm. and if you you know use political tools that we have here we live in a country where going on the street doesn't put you in prison which is a privilege uh, so we should use that and especially sweden is quite bad at it mm. as we see with the current government who wants to follow that any hands any questions for our speakers Deep thoughts, deep thoughts. There we go. Could you stand and tell us your name and then help us out? Hello, uh, my name is Victor Barry and I'm from Dream Architects here in Malmö. And I have a question to you, uh, Ina. Thanks for your presentation, by the way, about polyphonic assemblages. And the question in summary is about anthropomorphism, whether that's a risk or resource. So just to flesh it out a bit, uh, so anthropomorphism is uh, the concept of giving other things than humans, human uh, thoughts or uh, attributes. So for example, uh, I was sick 
a couple of months ago in uh, tonsinitis, I think it's called. Mm. And I had to take uh, antibiotics. And that, of course, will kill some of my gut biome. Um, but what if I would have thought, well, what about my bacteria? How will they think about that? Would they like to be exterminated just because I have this uh, this flu now? Um, and that might go against what's good for me. Um, and I think in a city scale, of course, this is an example of when it might be bad for me to uh, emphasize with my bacteria, but it might also be good. Mm. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, of course, we get that feedback a lot about uh, humanizing species when we when we do a workshop where we ask like to take the perspective of a crab, right? Okay, uh, aren't you putting the human perspective on the crab? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and cards on the table, I don't want to humanize crabs. I want to crabanize New Hammond. Like that's my that's my end goal, right? <laughs> so through the process of actually trying to understand your gut bacterium, maybe you're not going to make the decision of okay, I'm going to die now because they want to survive. Uh, and also you're connected. I mean, that's also the entanglement is kind of important, right? Understanding how you're connected to each other. So through this process of reflecting on this, you become more naturalized, I would say, right? So we become more literate and understanding uh, not only the actors around us, but also how we are connected to them. And that's basically the most important part for uh, in this uh, polyphonic assemblages, as I understand. Any other thoughts, Carl, Finn? Anthropomorphism. I uh, just <laughs> wonder if crabs crabanize humans themselves. You know, think think of what we're doing through the eyes of crabs. Yeah. I think it's just natural that we do it. And it's the only way we're going to be able to understand the world is putting it through our own uh, languages and understandings, but be aware that they're different. Mm. Everyone's different. Yeah. Mm. What was the frog's name? Fraud. Fraud. Roderick. Froderick. Yeah, yeah. He probably really didn't like giving that him name. a house. Yeah. He hated that name. Uh, other questions from the audience in the back. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Miriana, design strategist at Loida. And I know that the moderator uh, mentioned, yeah, please ask questions. But I, I have a little uh, nice storytelling prior to my question. We love I stories. Yeah, I believe it's very important. Uh, when Alexander the Great started building Alexandria, the city, a uh, bunch of sea monsters jump out of the sea and started plotting the foundations. And as much as they build it, the monsters would, would come overnight and ruin everything. And then again, and then again, and then again. So uh, he called the wisest man, wisest man. <laughs> we go back to Wisdom Flynn, Flynn and, and um, ask them to participate how to solve the problem with the monsters and, and rebuild the city or build the city further. And then they came up with the idea of building a glass box in mm. which they mimicked the monsters similar, uh, uh, the ones that were coming in, in the night under the sea and plotting, ruining the, everything that was built during the day. And when the monsters mimicked, uh, actually the, the artificially made, mo human made monsters, mimicked the real ones from the under the waters, uh, actually, they, ex they, they expelled them and the city was built. Mm. Um, and I mean, in all the splendor, in all the glory, we know what later on came on with the Library of Alexandria, the temples and so on and so forth. So in this regard, I, liked, I, I wanted to use this story to ask about the reflective practices in the creationist process. Because I believe the reflective practices we need to come up with in building, in designing, in creating uh, whatsoever, not only building our city's wise way, are as creationist as the very process of the design, as the very process of creation. So in that sense, I would like to ask the three of them, like, what are their creationist reflective practices upon designing? Mm. Okay. Thank you for your story. They definitely have a place here. Mm. Um, I can try and start. Um, I think uh, it's, it's a really important question and um, it's very hard thing to do, to be perfectly honest, in when you're working within uh, a planning system that works in a very linear and structured 
uh, way, particularly in Sweden. I think I'm used to working in a UK context where um, everything's a, a bit more chaotic and the reflection happens in the gaps between when you plan and the reality of what happens and a kind of bouncing between the two. In, in Sweden, we have a much better structured, more organized and more linear process, but it also, uh, funny enough, leaves less time for, for reflection because there's less friction. Yeah. Uh, and it's a kind of, in theory, it's a little bit more seamless. And I think this, this kind of, the, the, the gaps or the friction that you get from jumping scales, from going between delivering and planning and thinking in between uh, is quite a healthy way of, of reflecting, at least I've found it useful in my own practice. Um, so one of that's one of the reasons we're doing, for example, things like with Malmo in the making, testing things on site, building full scale prototypes um, with quite an open and loose brief as the first stage of in in a um, big long uh, urban regeneration project in Nihamn and, and, and Rosengård, um, so that what will be a fundamentally quite a small physical project will will, will create a bigger space for reflection. And critical practice in, uh, that will be hopefully open to everyone who's working on that project and will influence the outcome um, but also wouldn't underestimate for me personally the value of events like this because mm. it's in preparing talks or it's in listening to questions and thinking how to respond to your questions i mean that that's being perfectly honest that's where i get most of that space uh to to reflect at all between the marching of the planning process Carl, do you see any of that in, it strikes me as you're talking about this being a linear process, the differences between, you know, a waterfall versus an agile process and whether or not as we're building out uh, technologies in our infrastructure that are trying to take us from smart, smart to wise or perhaps be more transparent, accountable, trust, build more trustworthy systems, how we do that in an agile way so that it leaves time for reflection. I mean, having experience, I mean, you mentioned Waterfall, you mentioned Agile, having sort of been in the software development industry within both paradigms. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, sure, it's a little bit, Agile is a little bit more Agile, absolutely. You work more on sprint basis and you do evaluate sort of why do you want to put this activity into this particular sprint. So there's a little bit more relevance to uh, reconsider what you want to do. But at the same time, there's always a product plan. Mm. And that's on a yearly basis, possibly a three-year basis or a five-year basis, depending on the size of your company. So there's less wiggle room in agile thinking than people would like to give it credit for. Uh, so I think a lot of the creativity comes when people are sort of questioning, am I in the right place? Should I do this or should I be somewhere else? So one of the things that many companies really struggle with is people jumping between jobs and they have to sort of restart and re-contextualize uh, themselves in new areas. But I think as, a, as an area itself, I think it's really healthy that people stop and think about that and, and consider really what is it that they that drives them to work because at least the people that I meet, it's not the money side that drives them. It's more the, am I fitting in within this context and am I getting to do the things that are developing to me and are meaningful for someone else? So I think, I think there's a lot of questioning, um, uh, in terms of is this company for me, but not as much questioning in terms of is this solution going to be flexible enough in the future? Mm. There's a reason for this. And I mean, the entire sort of Toyota model as it initially was, was about not just building potential into systems, but actually maximizing the use of the, the systems you already had because there's a lot of waste if you build potential everywhere. Mm. But if you don't build potential for the future, you also end up in the situation that, for instance, the automotive industry ended up in. And that was you build stuff, you assemble cars in a way that's as cheap as possible so your price point to sell is as low as possible. But 
then the cars just become worse and worse very quickly. There's no way to maintain a strong sort of product over time. And this is something they're certainly struggling with within the automotive industry, uh, to continue that example, because right now the development goes towards I mean, everyone wants a car that learns more about you over time and becomes better rather than worse. And this is a, a change in how we view sort of software development mm -hmm. uh, and the role that software development has in sort of taking our objects from being rather specific in purpose to being more adapting to the context of their actual use. Um, so I think I think the the, the drive towards moving. I don't want to say, I mean, others say intelligence, but uh, the drive to move a lot of the, the attempts to project intelligence into the software realm is a healthy one, not least because uh, we don't restrict the items that we provide to a single purpose. It's way easier to have systems that you can update based on actual use patterns. And I mean, you built this one thing, but after a year, you realize it's actually these users that get the most out of this. Mm. So it's much easier to then relook at your old product and go, let's then scrap all these other things that no one ever uses and just causes bugs. So I think there's a better way now within the sort of technology side to work with continuously improving products and making sure you you're providing the value that people are currently looking for rather than what they why they bought the thing mm. i mean i have a billion different devices for sure for research purposes also that i don't use anymore i know exactly why i don't use them but i i know why i thought i would need them so they are less relevant they are less adapting than the software side that belongs to it. Adaptive relationships. Uh, other questions? For, yep, in the back. Could you stand up, please, and tell us who you are? OK. Hey, my name is, is this on? Yeah, OK. Uh, my name is Jonas. And um, well, where I'm from, I guess I'm locally sourced from the region. <laughs> And uh, maybe built by global uh, trade of nut nutrients and uh, <laughs> knowledge somehow. Uh, my background is that I'm an architect, but I've not been in the field for some time. And I'm really thrilled to be here and appreciate your presentations. Uh, I was just thinking about um, uh, the theme of the wise or the, as your examples of the smart city, smart cities. And um, uh, well, one reflection to me is that some, sometimes it feels, or I got the sense that it's rather an optimized city than mm. so smart. And I came to think of if the of the theme here, if is the smart, the smartness or the wiseness here, is that an, is it a process, an act, or a thing? If you know what I mean, I'm kind of a practical person, and I really would like to know. Or is it all of it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lovely question. Who would like to start with that one? I can go if you want. Sure. <clears throat> I'm pretty solidly in the process side of this. Because to me, the, the actual value of whatever we build or design, for that matter, the value emerges as you are using it rather than at the point of designing. And I mean, I say that. Uh, com I have a very strong sort of design background and my parents still think I'm an industrial designer rather than the researcher that I actually am. That's as much as they understand what I'm doing. But I think it's, as a designer, I always really think of, oh, this is how it's useful and why it's useful. But I, I really think that there are certain things that you learn over time only about the objects that are around you and the value that they provide. And I think it's, I mean, one of the movements that we've seen the last many years is the sort of downsizing of how many things do we actually need? Um, because otherwise we just store stuff in boxes that we don't know what's in them. So I think, I think the wiseness comes from uh, the utility that the, and the values that the objects provide us 
in the particular times that we are using them. But sure, there are specific tools that only are useful if you want to build a really large bridge. You have to do some particular things for that very object, even if that object stays over time. So I think I think the process side is the strongest, but of course it's really hard to develop things that are going to last for a very long time. And I think this is one of the things that within architecture certainly um, has been poorly understood by a lot of people that the reason why the materials are chosen is not because they're expensive and fancy, but rather because they last over time. So I think the, the process side of the values should be emphasized even more. Mm. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think the smart cities as a um, term has has become a bit of a thing and partly perhaps the idea of shifting towards wise cities or other people talk about it's not about smart cities it's about smart citizens is is an attempt to to not not um let it become too much of a thing and by a thing i mean a, a product or a service that certain companies uh sell um to cities that are developing very fast and, and want to um yeah want to either control how that city develops or, or get data from it. Um, and I think there's a kind of reaction against that, um, which, you can, which you can see in the fact that smart cities is used a lot less now as a, mm. as a term, um, but also that people are trying to broaden and redefine what it could be, even if there was never really one definition of it. Um, for me, this, uh, that, that importance of shifting from cities, also shifting as from cities as things to having more of a perspective over time is fundamental in relation to, to sustainability because we need to have longer term time perspectives um, that are quite hard to have if you think of cities as things and products and uh, that you either digital products or physical products that you just kind of build and sell. Um, but also in terms of quality, because it's it, it, even though you talk about materials that last over a long period of time, the reality is that the more the way this city is built as a thing, mm. which has a short time span to it, the harder it is to make that decision to build with good quality materials that will last and therefore will be sustainable because mm. people will be able to look after them, will want to look after them and will want to keep them over a long period of time. Um, and ultimately it's, it's demolishing a building that's the least sustainable thing. It's not necessarily whether how it performs. Um, I mean, that helps, but uh, we, we, we need to avoid building stuff that we're going to demolish and demolishing stuff that we've already got. So the the challenge for me with uh, perhaps shifting from from a city as a thing and this smart idea to to thinking about a city over time and a more wise approach is is actually in in stretching the financial models that that determine how cities get built. Um, and that's to do with for example, the financing behind housing, which has very short time scales of 15 years, investment cycles, maximum return on investment. It's very hard to, to be sustainable over 15 years mm. or to build something of good quality if your time span is 15 years. Political cycles, obviously, quite short. We're all working more or less with the private sector who have quarterly reporting terms. We're all influenced by internet and news cycles that are happening increasingly on short-term cycles. So for me, the, the, the challenge in moving towards wisdom is about how we can all work to kind of stretch our time perspectives. Um, and, uh, and only then we'll be able to justify um, uh, or motivate genuinely more sustainable longer-term uh, decisions that can, that, that can not just build something and then forget about it, move on to the next thing, but a bit more like you describe in tech. Uh, build something, look after it, test it, learn from it, change it, adapt it, improve it. Mm. Um, and those are, those are the kind of cities that tend to work better. We have two for process. Anna, do you have a predilection? Yeah, I had time to predilection? think. I had time to think, so, you know. I think wise is a relationship for me, or a kind of an ideal of a re relationship that we're trying to go towards. Because um, I don't think the current poly crisis that we find ourselves in is, you know, caused by lack of the right tech solutions or the lack of a knowledge or lack of skill. It's really a relationship problem, right? We have a really broken relationship with non-human nature, but we also have a broken relationship of 
who has wealth, for example, mm. um, right? We have, there's just a small amount of people who have a huge amount of wealth. Those are the relationships, sorry, <clears throat> that are actually really making uh, lives of people and also us and non-human nature miserable. Uh, not really like, yeah, as I said, those things. So I think a why, this idea of why is, is trying to find ways of start to having relationships with each other, with on a city level, uh, with non-humans that are less harmful. Uh, and I think the, I didn't really feedback or like give an answer to your question with the reflection. I think reflection is an important tool in that, right? Like we all kind of need therapy, our societies need some kind of form of therapy and rethinking, okay, we've been in abusive relationships either as, you know, victim or as the a doer or sometimes the mix of it, uh, depends on the situation. And we kind of need to find a way out of it. Hmm. We need a wise old grizzled city. That's what we sound like with deep relationship knowledge. Um, we're going to wrap up for today. Unless there's a burning question that has to be answered right now in this room. No. Okay. The speakers will be out and about a little bit afterwards. Please don't forget to pick up a book if you'd like, uh, The Patterns of Light and Dark from our last Foresight Cycle. And I hope we'll see you at the conference on August 29th and 30th, where we'll release the book for this cycle on the futures of wise cities. Um, I hope you'll join me by giving a warm round of applause to our speakers today for their time and energy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to find more seminars, it's on our program. And that's it for today. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Friday weekend. Uh, take care. Be in good relationships with one another. <laughs>